Um, so hi, um, as Jonas said, my name is Stefano and I'm a professor at the University of Malta. Um, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, Malta is a small island state city at almost in Africa, <coughs> down here. And uh, that is like my home base. When I'm not teaching in Malta, I'm sometimes teaching in the United States, in California. So uh, I'm not really used to this kind of climate. Uh, still, it's, used, it's nice to be here, uh, so climate notwithstanding. And what do I do in these places? I normally teach about uh, philosophy of technology or game design. Um, why game design? Because in the past I've been working as a game designer for the entertainment industry. Um, some titles you might not know. I helped some other teams to play, uh, to develop titles that you might know instead. A few other titles. I worked there for about uh, 12 years full time. And then I went and decided to throw that career down the toilet by getting a PhD in philosophy, which some might consider a bit maybe boring or crazy or a bit of a waste. Uh, you probably know that I don't think that way. Actually, I don't think it's a waste or it's there in contradiction, but rather they in a way participate to the same profile, at least the way I see it. Um, in the way that I work, I try to sort of use virtual worlds, sometimes gameful ones, sometimes not, to, in a way, materialize and negotiate and explore philosophical notions of the past. So, in a way, like to redigest a uh, philosophical tradition, and not only, but even to give rise to new ideas and new possibilities of thinking and uh, elaborating ideas that fall under the umbrella of philosophy. Um, so, to me, those two aspects, the making and the thinking, are not necessarily in contradiction, they complement one another. And I hope that uh, my talk today would be another example of that. Uh, this is not one of my usual talk, if you've been to the ones that I've given before, in which I talk about my work and I explain in which way are they philosophical, how did I manage or not manage to explain a certain idea or to reveal a certain possibility. Um, I'm going to talk about something else, and namely of my contribution to this book called Experience Machine. This is the machines. This is the copy that uh, you own, uh, and Jonas was kind enough to, to bring it here. But it's very relevant and related to these topics. So this is going to be sort of part of, I mean, it's going to tie into the notions that you have already about my work. If you don't know anything about that, these are the last two games that I developed with that kind of intention. So they're free and short and can be played on almost any device. Um, if you're interested to use it in your classes, for example, if you're instructors, or just out of curiosity of what does it mean to try to do philosophy through interactions and virtual worlds, these are perhaps good starting points. Um, this one came out in 2017, uh, and this two months ago. Uh, she tried to play it, but uh, for some reason there was a problem, so I hope that we can solve it later today. Okay. I'm gonna leave the slide on. Uh, in case you want to take notes, but if you put my name uh, online, mostly those are the things that you're going to find me for. Which is kind of crazy because, I mean, I've also been in academia for, I don't know, about 15 years. And to think that, I don't know, this <coughs> game in particular was played 80,000 times. Okay, 80,000 times. If you think that my best paper was probably read, I don't know, a few hundred times, then also might give you like an idea about I mean, what possibilities lie for you in terms of reaching audience and distributing ideas. So it's not just a matter of doing something fancy, but perhaps the audience today for philosophy might be more apt or more responsive to certain other ways to communicate. I mean, at least it does it for me. Like, I'm not, as I sometimes say, I'm not, for example, the, the best game scholar in the world, but not many can also do what they talk about. And this is sort of making me slightly more visible. Um, maybe in your respective disciplines you can also find clever ways of using computation and interaction to, in a way, refresh or extend an old um, cultural field, so to speak. I've, I've, I think I've talked too much about these things already, so since we're all bored, I can move on. Um, I talk about my work in this book here, which I don't uh, raise for promotion, but just to introduce the idea that most of what I'm going to talk about today has to do with the notion of something being virtual. And since there's plenty of notions and plenty of approaches and plenty of interpretation of that, what that means, to be absolutely certain that you get my point, I'm going to try to propose you what I particularly mean in this presentation. So, here we go. The quality of being virtual. Um, in its etymology, virtual was a word that was invented in the Middle Ages, in the late medieval Latin, 
To translate the Greek notion of dynamis, which means potentiality, power, transformation, and so on and so forth. So in this first uh, understanding, virtual means something that um, is latent in a certain situation, something that is not yet expressed, something that is possible to become. I'm going to make an example in this of this first uh, understanding of the virtual. If you come from literature, you might know uh, Raymond Queneau, Cent Mille Milliards de Poèmes, A Hundred Thousand Billion Poems, which is a book articulated in a way that you can sort of combine your own sonnet. A sonnet of, is made of 14 lines and you can swap them around in a book given the editing um, of the book itself and have the possibility to recombine about a hundred thousand million poems. So we could say, for example, that the one, the page that I have the book opened at is the state of things. Th that is the poem that is actually the case, right? But the book contains also 99,999 9 potential poems that are not yet expressed by the book, or at least that are not the case right now. So this will be the actual poem, the actual state of the book, but the book contains other 99,999 9 potential sonnets. A closed book would be completely 100%, 100 million, 100,000 million poems, virtual uh, sonnets, right? None of them are currently expressed. Perhaps a better way to understand this is with games. Like you could say that, say that a game state in a particular game of chess is currently the state of affair of the game, and that could develop into virtual possibilities that are, that are dictated by the rules, right? In game studies, we, we use the idea of game dynamics when we mean exactly the possibilities in which a game state can develop on the base of certain rules. Same as video games, same idea, right? Like there's, this is the currently the state of Pac-Man and the state of Pac-Man responding on user input can develop into a number of other states which are more or less successful, more or less interesting and so on. So these are the current state of facts. These are the actual chess situation. There are a number of virtual chess situations that can develop from that uh, position. So this is the first uh, uh, notion of what virtual means. And you might have used it like, I don't know, have you done your homework for your master's course? Well, virtually I'm done. I mean, there's a possibility that developing the direction of that being done, but that is not done yet. So far, so good, right? This is like often frequently used also nominally in your everyday life. Um, but I want to propose another one, which is equally common. So we can understand virtual not opposed to actual in the sense of that it's currently the case, but actual in the sense of that is part of the world that we share. That is part of the world that we inhabit and share as biological organisms. Let me make you another example so that I hopefully can reach you with this notion. Let's take a flight simulator. We could say that um, the tarmac, the wind currents, the gravity that uh, we experience through a, a simulator are virtual in nature, meaning that I can have experience of them, but they're not part of the world that we share of, um, that we share as biological creature, right? They are, they are created so that I could experience, but they do not belong to this world, strictly speaking. Experientially they do, but in fact, they don't, right? This is another quick definition of what virtual means. So something virtual is not actual in fact, but is actual in terms of its experiential effects. I could continue because I studied the notion of virtual with like five or six other possible definitions, but um, I would like to use this one for now because it's kind of handy. So when I talk about something virtual, I normally talk about something that is not belonging to this world, in fact, but can be experienced um, as if. For example, in this kind of sex simulators, I mean, the person is currently not having sex or actually not having sex with an actual woman, but is kind of experientially, into a degree, going through an, an analog, um, and sorry, an analogous uh, situation. I normally work in philosophy of technology and computer game studies, meaning that to me the notion of the virtual is normally applied to the digital medium in particular. So you could also have a fictional virtual, but I don't want to get into that. So last little part of this boring introduction to my topic, now that we in a way establish, or at least you at least are informed of what I mean by virtual, 
what do I mean by virtual worlds? When I talk about the virtual world, I talk about an interactive environment that is upheld by computers that can be experientially accessed and returned to at will. This notion also entails a degree of stability. It's something that does not exist in fact, it exists experientially, but it has a degree of stability. I can go back to it and it's possible for me to understand what's going on and to in a way create time-honored convention and time-honored mental models in relation to that world. Um, the idea, for example, of the Mars rover is an example of a world that is not virtual. As in, I still uh, experience it through computers, but it refers to a world that is still belonging to our reality, so to speak. So, in this case, we would call the experience through the Mars rover something like a telepresent interactive environment rather than a virtual one. Do you understand the difference? Virtual would need to be like supported and upheld and experienced through a computer to a point that it does not factually belong to the world that we inhabit. The distinction is troublesome and maybe we can even talk about what it entails because of course then you tell me, well, in a, in a sense, like it's a digital artifact, so it also belongs to our world. If we treat that as computer Mars, then it's also part of our reality, so it becomes more complicated. But if you accept a perhaps banal simplification and for now, we could say that, let's say, that Mars is part of our, let's say, actual world, and whereas a Mars that I experience, say, in a video game uh, is not. Perhaps a rough simplification, but you might want to accept it. If you don't, maybe we can have a discussion afterwards and you can explain me why. You might be completely right, but this facilitates the discussion that I want to have. So this is a kind of boring introduction to what I'm going to talk about. So I presented two understanding of virtual. I said that I would like happily take the second, meaning when something does not kind of formally belong to the world that we label as actual, then we call it virtual. And especially as a game scholar and as a philosopher of technology, I refer to worlds that are not part of our actual world because a computer is in a way currently generating. Yeah, mm -hmm. convinced more or less. This is as hard as it gets. The rest is all downhill, okay? Right? Any sort of doubt or question at this point? Apart from why? Why do you do this stuff? Like, that's no, always... Uh, so because back in the day, when virtual was kind of a buzzword, <laughs> you, you could have a virtual seminar. And I always reacted to that because I just thought that the seminar is not virtual. Mm. The seminar room could be virtual. Depending, again, on the kind of yeah. definition that you uh, decide to accept. Uh, Certainly. <laughs> like, I, as I told you, like, there's probably like seven mainstream definition of virtual and by one or another you could call that a virtual event or not. Like, again, it really depends on how you frame the discussion. For example, as a social object, a virtual call is not virtual. But yeah, I mean, perhaps we are complicated the matter beyond what is needed for this talk. But stuff that you want to keep in mind, and if you like, oh my God, how many angles and how many disciplines are taking approach to these digital worlds? You can write to me and I can give you indication, like bibliography, like at least the basis to continue to follow this rabbit hole by yourself. Or you can invite me another time and do a talk just about that. But I think that would be kind of, we would be me, you and just another student, Jonas. So I'd, okay. So, so far so good, right? I introduce what I think I mean by virtual world and it involves the use of a computer that generates something that can be experienced to a degree of permanence said it uh, already three times and you might be tired of me, so let's go on. So experience machine, we, ta we start with the talk proper and we begin now. So the experience machine is a famous thought experiment proposed in 1974 by Robert Nozick, who's an American philosopher also known for his great looks. Yes. Um, the, this thought experiment takes place in a book called Anarchy, State and Utopia, and it's just three or four pages long, actually I think two and a half pages long. It's not like a big chunk of the book, but it's made the book quite um, visible. Before we even continue, I don't know if anybody here has a humanistic background or philosophy maybe, some, some of you have. Is somebody here who do not know what we mean when we say a thought experiment? 
less everybody. So I'm asking because I prepared a couple of slides, and if you say like, nah, go on, like hap happily, just move on. Do you think you want a little? Quickly. quickly, okay, <laughs> very quickly. So what do we mean by a thought experiment? In philosophy, they are considered to be mental exercises, which, how are they done? Well, normally text or a speaker proposes a situation which doesn't exist, a hypothetical situation. Um, and then I ask you questions about it. And I challenge you to perform mental exercises about those situations and possibilities to think them through. Sometimes they're about notions of identity that get complicated because of the situation or ethical decisions that I would ask you to make in a very complicated and ambiguous situation. So they serve as tools to think through various consequences of certain scenario. Um, you might be wondering, why do we need sort of this sort of dreamlike hypothesis when we think about things? Can not, not we just like enact them and see how we behave in a way? Well, like in some cases that is not so easy because they involve tying people to rails of trams. For example, this is the trolley problem, 1967 by Philippa Foot. Again, like it puts you in the condition like, had you the control over a lever, would you let this tram out of control, run over five people or one person. What rights do you have to pull the lever? And what if you knew that one person? Would it still, how much does a human life matter if it's infinite? Then five times infinite and one infinite is the same. So how do we think about, okay, do you get what I'm trying to say? Other thought experiments like Swamp Man, very famous, proposes the idea that a man walks into a swamp and a lightning strikes and destroys this man into tiny molecules, completely destroyed. At the same time, in another part of the same swamp, a lightning hits the swamp and recombines by sheer coincidence molecules and atoms and biological functions to create the same man, right, as the one that entered in the swamp. Could we say that this person is the same person that got into the swamp? And if he walked back into town, would people think he's different or the same? And what does it mean to be the same? And, and then it, like you think about teleportation. Is teleportation actually a killing machine that reproduces you or something similar next to you or something? Okay, so again, we don't have the possibility to create a swamp in which you're hit by lightning that by coincidence create a copy of you. Um, one of those impossible thought experiments is the experience machine. And why is this impossible? Because the basis of this idea is that Let's suppose that we have a computer that can simulate reality in a way that is indistinguishable to how we relate to the actual world. So that when I put this helmet, or uh, Robert Nozick talks about a tank, an experience tank, you do not know you're in the tank and you cannot distinguish that experience from your everyday life. You understand why that needs to be hypothetical. We're not there yet. Maybe we will never be there. But that helps us think about something. And this talk today is about that something. So the experience machine. Robert Nozick, around page 90 of the book, says something like this. Imagine a machine capable of experientially and permanently substituting the actual world with the virtual one. So he also says permanently in the sense that you can only plug into this machine if you decide to do it for the rest of your life. So there's no plugging in and plugging out, otherwise it might be something like virtual reality or video games that we currently experience, just on a higher level of granularity. So it's a commitment machine to a, to a degree. It says like, you can have a virtual life, but you will need to resign your, um, and uh, you can have a virtual life, but you can resign your actual one. What would be the trade-off? The trade-off would be that we guarantee that you're gonna be super happy in the one uh, within the machine. Regardless of what, means for you to be happy, we can program whatever you want. You want to struggle and succeed, you want to be a famous actor, you want to be a woman, you want to be a man, you want to be a cat, a dog, or something else, or you want to, I don't know, be immortal, or incredibly successful, or whatever. I don't exactly know what you qualify at happiness. He doesn't even talk about it. He says, like, you will express it, we will program it for you. If you don't like it, we can still amend it. So there's no chance of making the mistake of, oh my God, I entered the machine at 13, I was loving pizza and video games, and now I'm 99 and I need to go on with... No, you can adjust it so that you're perfectly happy. That's the guarantee of the machine. You will need to relinquish your actual life and you will be perfectly happy. Hypothetical machine. Right? Of course, says Robert Nozick, while you're in the tank, you will not know that you're there. You'll think it's actually happening. So to a degree, this machine also needs to make you forget that you ever decided to plug in and that you ever walked to this machine and plugged in and so on. 
And you would think and feel as if you were writing a great novel or making a friend of or reading an interesting book. So once you're in, you will not be able to make to, to remember even what you were before. So you will really be there. There's not going to be a comparison between your past life and this life. It's a commitment, a commitment machine in which you commit to artificial happiness. Okay. In case such a machine existed, and now we come to the question that normally defines many of these thought experiments, like would you pull the lever? Or is this person from the swamp the same as the person who walked into the swamp? So if this machine existed and the pleasure and satisfaction it offered were guaranteed, would you plug into this machine for life? Now, I asked you before if some of you had a background in philosophy, some of you nodded, at least maybe not in philosophy, but in literature anyway, you were exposed to humanities kind of knowledge. So some of you might be like kind of, hey man, that reminds me of something, right? Like in philosophy, we talk about say Plato's cave as an allegory in which we say like, well, maybe the way in which we perceive the world is actually distorted and illusory to an extent. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe you could say like, well, also Descartes talk about like, uh, maybe there's an evil genius outside of our consciousness that is actually feeding our brain with experiences and we're not really living and you're not really there. I just have the impression of being in Gothenburg, whatever Gothenburg means at that point, and lecturing people. I actually by myself in a vat and fed by an evil genius. Yeah, I mean, maybe you've seen The Matrix is based on s similar ideas, right? However, I would say that the experience machine is very different from these two previous thought experiments and allegories. And it's perhaps better understood as, I don't know if, you've, if you follow Rick and Morty, um, there's a machine called Roy A Life Well Lived. And I will show you a clip in which that is explained, because this helps, I think, figuring out what the difference is between those ideas and what Nozick is presenting. So let's see if I can do it without Oh, yeah, awesome. Let's see if the volume is okay. So you've seen what I mean. And in which way do I claim that this is actually, I mean, that the experience machine is, experience machine is closer to this than to Plato's cave or the brain in the vat? Well, first of all, the machine in this thought experiment is encountered as a machine. So is encountered as a, as a possibility of being, whereas in the other two occasions, we are born with, we are born with the illusion that that is reality. So we are offered an alternative that is artificial. In the case of Morty, of course, like he's not really willing to try it on, he's put it on, but in general, like we have a choice in relation to this machine and we have an awareness in relation to this machine, which we don't have in the ideas like brain in the vat or the uh, Plato's cave, correct? This idea um, is not, of course, um, pioneered by Rick and Morty. The idea of a machine that can simulate, add, or allow us an escape from reality is something that um, was present in literature explicitly, at least until, I mean, before um, the 30s, when um, Green, Peyton, Wettenbacher wro wrote a short story called The Chamber of Life, which is the first literary apparition of this idea. So a machine that can take over in the entirety of your sensations and your presence in a place. And that is one example. I'm sure that if you read literature or if you like movies, you have heard about, for example, Greg Egan's um, Permutation City. Radio Player One also has a degree of that, like a machine that willingly substitutes reality in al almost an unrecognizable and untraceable way. Uh, Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson is also based on one of those ideas of virtual reality being totalizing in that sense. Um, Popular media. Uh, you have an episode of the Griffin um, in which they invent a machine that allows you to be somebody else and experience the world through their eyes in a particular situation or in Futurama, the what-if machine. They tend to do a similar idea. So you encounter them as a machine and the experience of this machine offers you something else that is not compatible with your everyday life, but it's also non um, possible to be told from inner lived experience. If you like movies, Total Recall has a similar machine or um, Existence. I don't know if you like game studies. This is often quoted, yeah, by Cronenberg. Um, 
in video games, like Assassin's Creed has a similar machine, like the um, Animus works in more or less the same way. Or if you liked Fallout New Vegas, it actually offers tanks in which you can play another video game within the video game, like escapism from the video game itself. It's just crazy. I mean, okay. Are you familiar with any of these examples, perhaps? Are you gamers here? Any gamers? Any takers? One? 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 Oh, another person. <laughs> okay. Um, so, to recap, how is this different? How is the experience machine different from uh, previous thought experiments? First, it's present to us as a machine as, again, the materialization of certain possibilities of being. And we can decide to whether use it or not. Do you want to plug in for life or not? Nobody's going to force you there or nobody put you into this world already connected to one. So there's one difference. It can be programmed in the sense that we have some degree of control of what the machine is doing. We're not just relinquishing our desires and will, but we are owning the machine and we're capable of um, programming what the machine offers us. And even if we were originally wrong, the machine can be stopped and reprogrammed. Although that's kind of weird because while in the machine, how do you know you're in the machine and dissatisfied? I mean, do you understand? Like, Part of the promise of the machine is like, you now know you're in a machine, but then you need to know that you're in a machine to change it. Anyway, he doesn't go into that. So to summarize the second part of the presentation, I hope you understand that the experience machine was not meant to raise doubts about what we consider real or whether reality is an illusion, but rather to help us orient our moral compass with a question such as, if a machine offers pure, unbridled pleasure, why would we not decide to join it? Is there something else that matters to us as humans we, with this world in which it's cold and exams take a long time and it's hard to find a job and romance is also hard and sometimes you get sick and it's all unpleasant? What do we value about all of that negative when we can only have positives? So are we only driven by the pleasure principle in our life or is there something else that we value about being here and now as bodies with all the faults and defects? And so would you plug in, he says, if you were given a chance? Would you abandon the world? And he said, like, he offers three um, points as to why we would really not like that. And just thinking about it, he said, like, well, I mean, the general person, I think, would consider that to be like a, the, to be something to be lost there, to be something almost like in um, hedonistic escapism. To a degree, he thought that the machine was a kind of pleasurable suicide, right? You remove yourself from both the pains and the pleasures of this life and the affections and the connections that you have in this life just to be happy by yourself or at least to escape the pain. So he openly says that the plugging into the machine is a kind of suicide. So he offers three points, but they're not really important to mention now. Just, just imagine that he says, I think not. I think there's something to be lost, although it's hard to pinpoint exactly what, but it's not the same to have fun all by yourself artificially as it is to participate to a world, so to speak. This is generally the idea behind the experience machine, and so what about this book? So uh, a set of editors at the Roman Littlefield decided to ask a bunch of people, including yours truly, to talk about the experience machine today, like about 40 years after it was originally thought about, especially in light of the fact that virtual reality technology is becoming sort of almost like, what do you call it, like um, user technology is becoming, perhaps some of your friends already let you try some parts of it. Um, the quality of the resolution of both the uh, visuals and the quantity of things we can show and do in these kind of words is increasing. So somebody wondered, well, does anything change about the world now that we know more about these digital worlds? We're approaching perhaps like a livable, to a degree, uh, virtual reality, which might be substituting to a degree a large percentage of our life. Uh, is there something worth thinking about it today, now that we have extra information? So they asked a bunch of people, including media scholars, ethicists, uh, game scholars, and they all tried to give different angles as to what that experiment can mean today. And I'm going to talk about two in particular. Uh, one of them is by a guy called Daniel Petruccia, who was a master's student similar to yourselves. He wrote this, um, his essay as a master's student. 
And I'm bringing it up because I think it's particularly interesting and it's going against the current of the entire book. Most of the people in the book, similar to your friend on the back, I don't know her name, but would say, nah, I mean, I think there's too much going on in the real world and my everyday affection have a weight despite the fact that it might be painful sometimes and that we might die or that the world is generally terrible. He's one instead, this Daniel Petruccio, one of the few that say like, well, slow down with this no-no. There might be something to be said about plugging in instead. And he calls his chapter Intuition and Imaginary Failure. So he thinks that if we say no, we might be under the spell of two different problems with imagination. What are those problems? I'm going to try to show you right now. First of all, he says, everybody writing in this book is mostly a white academic person with a job, and so with certain aspirations and expectations, but with very little problems in their life. life. Of course, you can be uh, dissatisfied with, uh, for example, the amount of work that you have, or again, how much snow fell over Gothenburg. But in general, it's a pretty lofty life, I would say. Everybody in this group here is a white person, and everybody apart from two is um, a male person. So he said, like, this sort of male, white, Western, academic, world that is represented here is not necessarily the entirety of the world population. Actually, it's just a very, very tiny sliver. So he proposes this idea. Let's suppose that this is sort of the white academic amount of pleasure and hope. This is pleasure and hope, right? And it's kind of high, okay? Like, they say, like, imagine the machine gives you this. He's really quantifying this problem, right? Say, like, this is the male academic, let's say, MA. This is <laughs> experience machine, EM. And he says like, well, the fact that this delta here, so this difference is so tiny, gets us to say that. That means that our hope and aspirations are not all that bad and the difference would be so minimal that it wouldn't make too, so much sense to abandon your family, your jobs, maybe the environment or whatever, the possibility to live a genuine life just for this little delta of pleasure. So he would say like, yeah, for a white academic male, this is too little to actually make the jump. But the, the book does not really treat, for example, like a Chinese mine worker or somebody born in slavery or somebody who is from a minority, or somebody who's oppressed. Do you know what I'm talking about, right? So he says, like, well, imagine like a minority person or an oppressed person with this much hope and pleasure from life. He says that this D now is so significant, let's call it D2, it's so significant that it makes sense for them to do the, tran the transition. It might be worth its while for them because they're so miserable that even a fake bliss is much better than uh, the desperation, the hopelessness, and the work that they need to do every single day. So he says, one, Nozick uh, f thinks that we will feel revulsion at the pros prospect of uh, plugging in, that the machine is a self-indulgent escapism for the male academic that is writing this book, but it's quite obvious that there might be several cases where plugging into the experience machine is preferable to living or to committing suicide. Think about being in jail for life or be condemned to death. Wouldn't you rather go into the experience machine than being condemned to death, for example? So if this person has really very little hope and pleasure in the future of their life, they might decide that after all, this artificial paradise is something worth its while. So, Imaginative failure one, let's not generalize this perspective because we're talking about a privileged group that might not be interested in that small D, all right? D as in difference, of course. Second imaginative failure. Um, we are imagining that we can, in a way, quantify the, the pleasure that the experience machine is going to give us. But what if the experience machine is capable of giving through computers and inter artificial intelligence a pleasure that we cannot even imagine? So imagine that this is now up here and we cannot really think about what that, that means yet. So at that point, this D, D3, will be so big for us as well as white academics, like privileged people in the world, that we also might want to transition to that world. Am I making sense? So maybe we say no, because we cannot even imagine what it, what it could be like to be in that sort of like roller coaster ride, uh, because it doesn't exist yet, and we don't know what the computers are capable of in terms of pleasure. So the increased well-being available to the machine is potentially infinite, he says. 
And we cannot fully comprehend or imagine the ways in which the machine can satisfy us and, prov and provide bliss. And once we do realize, then we might be less um, prone to say yes, to say no, sorry. On the basis of uh, this initial um, discussion, I want to propose you uh, half of the content of my book here, uh, my chapter in this book. Um, I think you might be interested in it or not, and it relates a bit to what this guy is saying, but I'm coming not from a sort of social science perspective, but from the perspective of game design. So I ask myself, if I'm a game designer in today, and I were to build an experience machine, what kind of technology would I need? How would I go about making this world? How would I make it so adaptable and so on and so forth? So I started thinking about producing one, as in, what would it be like? What would we need? And I also started to think that, well, this is not the first time that this is brought up in the history of culture. As a matter of fact, Richard Wagner, when he talks about the uh, Gesamtkunstwerk, so the total work of art, he was talking about theater at the time, was talking about reaching a point in which is this work, this production, this opera is so um, sensorily engaging and so complete, like touching on something moving, sound, light, maybe even touch, to a point that the Gesamtkunstwerk would be able to, in a way, take over your existence and bring you to a new mental place, right? Capable of, in a way, taking over all of your sensory and conscious perceptions. So that is something that, uh, starting from the 19th century, we've been starting to discuss. Similarly, but with a different medium, um, movie critic André Bazin, uh, in The Myth of Total Cinema, is claiming that that is the aspiration of cinema itself, similar to how Wagner was saying that the theater ultimately will need to be this totalizing work of art. He said, cinema in the way I see it has not yet been invented because what I imagine is a totalizing experience in which the um, moviegoer also decides what to do and frees himself from also authorship of somebody telling them what to experience and what to be in those worlds. You can transcend, he says, time, space, and the desire also of who built those worlds. So you'll be free in a way that you are never free, and it will take over, over all of your perception. You will be fully immersed in what I mean as cinema, but we're not there yet. So many of his writings were about what cinema will need to be rather than what cinema was in the 60s. If you like game studies, you probably know that the notion of immersion in games, brought forward by a scholar called Janet Murray, is very, very similar. So it's the idea that one of the holy grail of digital experiences and games is that of, once again, taking over all of your experience, allowing you a freedom that you never had before, uh, never breaking, um, in a way, taking over your conscious life to a degree that it's so almost believable. Have you heard about the concept of immersion? I suppose so you're not. You probably can say the same in movies, but in video games has been like um, worked on a lot. has to do also with the notion of embodiment and how your bodily sensations also participate to that one. It's a longer story, and um, I might give you indications of a scholar that is absolutely um, focused on that aspect, which is called Gordon Kaleya, and like it focuses on immersion embodiment and in the digital world. Anyway, so what I'm trying to say here is that this is not medium-specific. It's an aspiration of culture that we've been having for at least the past 250 years. And we're still asking the same question today, like, will computer or will virtual reality now be that taking over sensation machine that we aspire to create? As a game designer, I ask myself, let's, let's look at this machine and how would I make it? I told you already, like, I'm not the first one to think about it, but let's see what he talks about and let's see how that can be translated into game design. So the first thing that I looked at was the fact that he seems to be talking about single-player virtual worlds. He never really says, like, single-player or single um, that is not shared, but it seems to me quite obvious that it's not shared. Why? If I dream of being uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, for example, and I decide to join a world in which other 200,000 want to be Cristiano Ronaldo, it is likely that my perfect happiness of being that one unique star player will be um, diminished. Or even like a worst case scenario, what if some of the user's deep desire is that of blowing up the world with a doomsday device? 
or being extremely evil to anybody or enslave all the population of the world, wouldn't that also limit my possibility to be happy in the way that I want to be? So it seems that it, the complexity of setting up this world and the possibility for somebody to ruin somebody's happiness would contradict the basic guarantee of happiness in the experience machine. So it is likely that if we were to build it, we would build them as confined experience. Am I making sense? Would you, would you agree to that? Like, no? If somebody wants to take over your happiness? What if somebody kills you and you've just signed up for, I don't know, 50 years of a great life as a scientist and, or an actress and somebody kills you at day two? Wouldn't that be like a bummer? To a degree. Okay. So think about that. I, since I don't want that to happen, as a maker, I would say like it's safer if instead of recreating a world, we create your world for each and every one of you. I think it's a necessary quality uh, that also uh, entails that virtual worlds are self-contained and they cannot influence one another. We cannot ever imagine spectating other people's lives, maybe as insects or ghosts, but that's a different story. So on this observation that I just made, I created a thought experiment within that thought experiment. So bear with me for a second. This is almost like, what do you call it, like inception, right? So what do I mean by that? L I propose you a question that stems from understanding the world as if the experience machine existed as a single player game. Let's see and s figure out what I mean. So my thought experiment. We suppose that Nozick single-player experience machines exist and that one can decide to plug into those uh, to live a happy and meaningful life. To, to decide what a happy and meaningful life, I do not know exactly what you like, guys. I mean, you might have your own decisions. Some of you might desire to be flying or to be something else. I don't, I don't know and I don't care, but likely, at least from the point of view of existentialism and psychology, you will probably need to be autonomous to a degree, so not forced to do stuff. You will need to have the possibility to grow and master something that you like to do, so you not only autonomous but also free to a degree. And the third quality that is normally associated with happiness from the point of view of behavioral psychology, or rather um, self-determination theory and existentialism, is the external validation of what you are and what you do. So. It's great if you're autonomous and you can do what you want, but you're not fully happy unless what you do is helpful to somebody or validated as valuable by somebody. I don't know if you ever played sports or competitive gaming, or if you ever lectured, if everybody were looking at you like, what are you saying? This is bullcrap. I would not feel good about myself. I don't know about you. So in general, like you need like autonomy to decide what to pursue, freedom to, become, to master that pursuit, and the fact that that pursuit and you as an individual are valued for what you bring. This is called external validation, doesn't matter. So with these premises, we're talking about Nozick single player machine and the desire to be autonomous, free to a degree, and validated externally. I'm asking you to imagine to say, uh, be a physicist. And imagine that for you, happiness means to work very hard, go through a lot of struggle, eventually come out with a discovery that blows the world up in terms of, not, not really blow, them, blow it up, but as in like, um, become, you become so widely known in the world for your discovery and so appreciated. Imagine like kind of, kind of Albert Einstein, like recognizes genius and your work has been used for good and evil in a bunch of different fields and everybody knows your name and blah, blah, blah. Let us suppose that this is what you want. Let us suppose that you're approaching this machine, right? And you're deciding to plug in and to become, to live the life of Einstein, let's suppose. Um, the clerk next to the machine will let you know that, well, my friend, please keep in mind that this is a single player machine, meaning that nobody will witness your struggles. Nobody will benefit of your, um, of your discoveries. This is kind of, nice also, right? But uh, they may also tell you like, well, I notice here that you're, you want to be a physicist, then you need to understand that the way in which we coded the machine relies on our understanding of physics, meaning that it's already a model of physics. It's an artificial reproduction of it. What we mean to say is that you cannot actually discover anything that we don't know already because we programmed that physics. Do you know what I'm saying? So in a way, nobody will, you will validate your struggle and your discovery will amount to nothing. Also, that is going to be fictional. You will not discover anything. If you're fine with the complete artificiality of that idea, please go ahead and enter the machine. 
So knowing these kind of things, would you plug in? My point here is that if we start from the premises that we looked at, then the machine promises you that you will not have an external validation to your happiness, but just a semblance of an external validation to your happiness. So you will know that you will be free and autonomous, but you will not be externally validated. Nobody will benefit from what you do. Nobody will witness what you do. So on that basis, I believe that most of us will be resistant to permanently limiting our emotion, our social engagement, and our professional effort, and our personal aspiration to man-made worlds. As they would, by definition, be missing outwards components to our existential meaning. So what I'm trying to do with my piece, at least in the first half, which is what I propose to you, is agree with Robert Nozick from a different point of view, like looking into what this machine would look like as a machine, and knowing that even what you discover within the machine, if that were uh, your aspirations, would amount to nothing. So there would be really no external validation, no external um, effects of whatever you do within the world. And I think that would deter a large amount of the population. In the piece, I, do, I also said that, well, there might be the case that for some people with really no hope or really no freedom, that idea might still be engaging because of how they feel. But in general, for the Western person that I sort of am part of, uh, we would not do that because we would always have hope, even no matter how tiny, to be useful for others and to complete ourselves in a way that is genuine. Sure, uh, maybe I'm almost done, so we can wait for a second. Okay, great. So I also want to look into this, um, do you remember this uh, Daniel Petrucha vision in which like, well, we cannot even imagine how much computer can make us blissful, but my point in a way plays against it in a sense that, well, we program how we get pleasure from the machine. So we can indeed predict how much pleasure and how the pleasure is gonna be given to us. The machine will not invent pleasure for us. Am I making sense here? So similar to the way in which, in which I said in my idea, the simulation of physics in the machine cannot be deeper or more granular than we manage to study and understand in relation to our world. But this is also true of pleasure and satisfaction that is stimulated in the machine. We have a certain idea of pleasure, we have a certain idea of happiness, and that is in a way coded artificially into the machine. There's nothing more in the machine that we put in as of yet. Maybe in the future with artificial intelligences, this might be possible. But currently, if we are asked to program the machine as the experiment says, we will only be able to produce what we already know. Am I making sense here? Maybe in a freer and more flexible way, but there's not going to be like this gap of imagination, precisely because it's our imagination that allows us to code it. So in my, po in my point, I mean, it's, it's a more modest version of Daniel in which he says, uh, in which I say, well, I think this is really going to be too tiny for us. And also knowing for sure that you're not going to be externally validated might be a deterrent for many of us including myself, including probably your friends that are thinking about maybe my family cannot be proud if I'm a scientist. Maybe I can be a lesser scientist, but in this world, I'll publish a nice little thing of some sort. It will still be more valuable than the semblance of having done that. So my answer would be no, and I would agree with a lot of other white uh, males in this book. Um, if you're interested, and I told you I was about to be done, this machine, uh, this book, <laughs> This machine, uh, it's in your library, and it's made of, I think, about 12 chapters, meaning that they're relatively um, self-contained. And none of us knew what the others were writing, so they're not really as connected as I wanted to show you here. Anyway, um, you might find something interesting, maybe for your thesis or something similar to that. They're written with the divulgation idea in mind, so it's not like technical philosophy with, I don't know, um, let's say, syllogisms and mathematical language and so on and so forth. So it's kind of novel-like, but with philosophical insights, and I think it's kind of interesting. If you want, at least, uh, you can look into that. If you're really, really uh, self-damaging, uh, then you can also pick up my, my book, which is a <coughs> bit harder. Uh, or uh, you can write to me and I can give you free texts that you can use that do not require you buying anything. Um, which is uh, another problem that maybe we can talk about in the discussion, like academic publishing and what does it do to knowledge. But that's another discussion. So I can give you stuff for free. You just need to write to me. I cannot just put it on the internet. That's, that's it. If you want to read about my next academic adventures, you can read, uh, I mean, you can look me up on Twitter or not. Um, and this will be it for today. I hope it was not too long. Thank you.
Thanks.